All right. If you don't see me, you just let your partners in crime know. That's Two of them shouldn't get it. Because they really gave it to them yesterday. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, how you doing? But everybody else should be good. No, I think she got hers yesterday. Oh, okay. Um, we have your disc. You didn't get that to you, eh? No. Can okay. I? Um. My sister said she wanted a receipt. Okay, yeah, okay, no problem. I'll, I'll give you a disc when you see today. We have the disc for one. Okay. That's a check you one now, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Huh? Thursday. What did you doing? Oh, I wasn't here. Oh, sorry. I went to the... My Grammy is in the hospital, so... Oh. So how's she doing? Well, one day she's fine, and the next day she's not well, so... She was supposed to come home yesterday, but she took work, so... Why? I'm sorry, you're right. I was about to duck again, but I said... How old is she? She's 86. Oh, okay. You're close to Huh? You're close to Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, this class, it seems like only to read the notes, because basically from last time, you just read the notes. Yeah. So, I guess the calculations can be have you different. Have you read other than come into class? Maybe not. It's going to be a lot of catching up to <laughs> I Especially the first part of basal stuff. That's a lot of... Yeah, I promised myself I need to start reading Yeah, this time is coming soon. It's almost yeah, like it's so June. It's already June. Yeah. I need to start. I promised this weekend. <laughs> I have to start somewhere. Yeah. Try and retrain. Put something up in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just asked Miguel, he said, with the open book, people are failing the exam. He said when they used to do it close, people used to pass, but because they were like, time, you know? yes, he said that's what it is, they waste time mm -hmm. looking yeah. through the material. That's why it's best to study and have it in here. Yeah. But just maybe have like the, the calculations. Yeah, down part. Yeah. Or, or, or do like definitions, like right. what I plan to do is get up. Acronyms to yeah. help you remember. And I plan to, what I do is when I type two, I tend to retain my oh, right. So I plan to type up everything myself. So that's what I plan to go through and make my own notes. And yeah, notes my own notes. presentations and yeah. stuff. So I get like my Word document and print and yeah. try to combine. That, that's, that helps you remember. Yeah. yeah. But I have to start. Yeah. I'm saying the same thing. I keep procrastinating. Y'all say the presentation goes in front of the textbook. The hand that he gave us last week. Oh, okay. So this should this should have been first. The presentation's first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why yours look so thin? I split it up. I split on. I put the first two in here, <laughs> and then the last three. Because I haven't looked at the first. <laughs> Just check. Me. I had to go over here for sure.
I know they had to finish liquidity and then go over the second handout. But there was the glass. We had liquidity and then we had a liquidity and what's the other risk? Investment. Investment risk. I thought we would finish those two. We had still had something else? Liquidity they had to finish off. Liquidity. Oh, okay. And then the handout number two, so I guess for I the told her to get the answers from me, oh, the okay. answer sheet, so I could look at what they did. Yes. Yeah. So I, I told her to grab any handouts. Yeah. Even though he said that's not going to prepare you for the exam, but at least it's just something. I don't know, see if I get print time questions. I did online before, so I got to see if I get a copy. So we're going to be doing, I guess we're going to have computers, we're going to be over there doing this, and we're going to have computers over there. I guess. I don't see why you can't do it at home. And then I wonder if you can stop and then go back. So we have to stay through, right? Three hours with you, or two hours? Two hours, that many questions. Let me take a reminder to remind me, Gallup, of the link. It's like, yeah, it's like, I'm going to respond to emails too. He's so busy. When I call him, respond, well, yesterday I was asking him to send me the paper of my presentation. He was doing something else, so I. He was, I think they have a presentation next week. They have an off thing on. That's them and I this week. Oh, this week. Oh, okay. So he's yeah. just busy up and now. So I live out east. I work out west, but I live out east. Oh. So we've been here at 5 30 to go battle to yeah. get to the east. Yeah. I get up at 4. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. I said, we got to be home by this time, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just need to work from 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did I go south? Was it? No traffic in the morning, beat all the tra morning traffic, and I beat all the evening traffic. I get to work in a half, 20 minutes, and get home in 20, 30 minutes. Okay. No traffic. Yeah. But I still put them in eight and a half, you have to eight and a half hours. Oh, no. <laughs> Those off shop bikes stay well, though. They have nice benefits, so I guess that's a trade-off, eh? <laughs> The benefits are nice, yeah. The only thing that comes out is um, our pension. So they take it, okay, you don't have to pay quite as big. Yeah, we, oh, okay. we pay 5%. Well, that's, that's not bad. And then they do 10%. Oh, not bad. Which is yeah. nice because now I'm fully vested, so I get everywhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's good. Wait, and you all get bonuses? That's good. Yeah, we get bonus, yeah. <laughs> and then we have socials and stuff. We just had fun day on Saturday. Oh, you put a to the beach. We went to Santos. Rose Island. Rose Island. So they took you on a boat to Rose Island. Mm -hmm. Nice. We go. Last year we went to Exorbitis. Oh, on a boat? Oh, yeah. Bowwater Ventures. How much is like, It's not much. Eh? It's about 70. Oh, that's good. Not nice. everybody comes though. Oh, and you're allowed to bring a gas. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. It was nice, it was nice and hot. The sun was not playing. Yeah, the business weekend was so hot. Oh, it was like, wow. So I had a 
We had a beach wedding on Sunday, and we were sitting out on the beach, and there was no shade. There was no, no tent or anything. It was kicking. I hope you're always cool. I took my umbrella. I figured I needed some. I'm glad I did. Yeah. It was, it was, it was hot. Even on Sunday. Yeah. I was glad we went to Luciano, so I was glad we did not sit outside. So we were able to get an inside table. Oh, okay. So like a restaurant over there. At Luciano's? Oh no, Luciano's. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hi. This for today? Put that on top of that.
just for the record, I gave this document to Miguel last week. I don't know when you got it. Uh, just now. Just now. I'm not taking the blame. <laughs> Everybody else was here was here last week, right? I was not. You weren't? Uh, I do have the material, though. You got it? Yeah. Remind of those you were here last week and those who weren't. There's no class tomorrow, next week, because I'm off the island. So um, I think what's going to happen is my class will be pushed back one week. So now the module will start one week late. But um, I'd recommend confirming that with Miguel. Let's get started. We're all here on time. Really, the beginning of today's module is a lot of reading, um, you know, definitions and the like. So, anybody who comes in late, it won't be difficult for them to, to catch up. It says course agenda, but you know, uh, I've added some bits to the, to the course. And what we did last week wasn't initially part of the course, um, but the agenda 
that we're going we're gonna to cover uh, today. We're going to look at um, defining market risk and the key components of market risk. We're going to look at Basel II and IFRS overview of on market risk. We're going to look at the using value at risk as a risk management tool. I think last week we learned there's really a risk measuring tool that assists with risk management. Uh, the importance of stress testing scenarios, setting market risk limits, and reviewing market risk models. So market risk and the Basel II overview. We're going to look at market risk as defined by uh, the Bank for International Settlements and then also as it's defined by the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. And then we'll look at Basel II Overview, Basel II Market Risk Framework, and the revisions of Basel II Market Risk Framework. Once again, I think the Bahamian Bison sector is still on Basel II, right? If you haven't started adopting or pushing through any of the Basel III requirements, so Basel II is still the, still the Basel on top. What are some of the key components of market risk? Uh, interest rate risk, currency risk, commodity price risk, and other price risk. Uh, definition of market risk as uh, defined by Basel II. You see that market risk is defined as the risk of losses in on and off balance sheet positions arriving from movements in market prices. The risks subject to this requirement are the risk pertaining to interest rate related instruments and equities in the trading book, foreign exchange risk, and commodity risk throughout the mine. Then if you look at IFRS on the next page, how they define it. Uh, market risk is the risk that the fair value of future cash flows of a financial instrument will fluctuate because of changes in market prices. Market risk comprises three types of risk, interest rate risk, currency risk, commodity risk, and other price risk. So, pretty similar definition. Definition of interest rate risk. Well, it's the risk that the fair value or future cash flows of a financial instrument will fluctuate because of changes in the market interest rates. Um, what I don't mention here is, you know, if you remember there's that inverse relationship between interest rates and bond prices, okay? In particular, if you've got a bond that has a fixed rate of interest, a fixed coupon payment, if market interest rates go up, bond price goes down. And the reason that is is because the yield to maturity in that bond has, has to be consistent with market interest rates. Okay? And the only way for that yield to go up is the price has to go down. I think what we should do is a little, we'll do a little um, example on how you value a bond. Because that'll give you some insight into what I'm talking about. Why is it that when market interest rates go up, the price of the bond goes down? And the reverse. When market interest rates go down, the price of the bond goes up. Uh, let's see how we can. Uh, I don't want to necessarily turn it off, but how do we. That was a high tech solution. All right. Um, <clears throat> So what is a bond? A bond is simply a series of cash flows, right? Initially when you invest, it's a negative cash outflow. And then on a given predetermined period, you'll get interest payments or coupon payments, and then at maturity, you get the principal back. So why don't we use a very simple example of a, a bond that pays, we use 5%, to try to be somewhat realistic. So 5% coupon fixed, and it's a five-year bond. Hello.
So this bond, the par value of a bond, here in the Bahamas, the government registers stock are $100 um, face value, but the rest of the world, a bond is $1,000. So we're going to use $1,000 as the face value. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I almost feel like, anyway. She just gave I think you guys that will be on the sign-in list. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to be here, you want to be here. If you don't, that's your problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. Face value equals a thousand. Coupon. Great. Now, for some of you are going to be like, this is uh, rather easy. But for those of you who are not familiar with the pricing of a bond, no point in talking about interest rate risk if you don't understand how bond pricing is affected by interest rates. Otherwise, kind of like, uh, what are you saying? Okay, so, and the term, five years. So, Oh, and uh, let's see, annual payments. So it's an annual bond, okay? So at the end of year one, what are you going to get? That's what you've invested in the bond. At the end of year one, what are you going to receive as far as your cash flow? Five percent of what? Five equals what? $50, right? Yeah. And at the end of year two, you're going to get another 50. Mm -hmm. Another 50. Another 50. Now, at the end of year five, what are you going to get? Yes. 1050 right? You get your, what you bought it at, from the face value back, plus $50. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if it so happens that the market interest rate is 5%, what do you think the price of this bond will be? So let's let's um market rate and bond value. But the market rate is five percent. Market interest rate. Now you're earning 5%, and the market's saying that you need to need to earn a return of 5%. The market interest rate is saying 5%. It just so happens they're exactly the same. So guess what the bond's value is going to be? 1,000 is going to be exactly what you paid for it. So the price of the bond will be exactly the face value, no difference. Okay. Now if the market interest rate, and the market is saying this, this, this entity that issued this bond, we think that they're riskier than they were before, and we think you need to earn 6%. That's, that's the market interest rate, okay? But it's only paying 5. How do you, how do you get a 6% return if it's only paying you 5% coupon? You're going to buy it at a discount, right? So it's going to be less than 1000 do a quick calculation to determine what that is. And if the market interest rate is 4%, so for example, the Federal Reserve cuts the Federal Fed rate, and the market interest rates all drop accordingly, what do you think this is going to be? Right now, this is going to be less than 1,000. This is going to be greater, right? Because the market's saying, no, you should only get 4%. But they're paying 5 so you've got to pay a premium. For example, if I own that bond, and it's giving me five, but I, I, the market is saying you only need four. Well, I'm not going to sell it to you, so you can have the five, and I get four. I'm going to sell it to you at a premium to make sure that I get I, I, I earn a premium on, on my investment. Good evening. So actually, we don't necessarily need to do the calculations. All right. Um, so just bear in mind if. When market interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And think about what if what if the all right, so the market rate is three percent, it's obviously less than a thousand. 
But if the market interest rate goes from three to four, what happens to the price of this bond? It's going to go down. All right. Now it's still going to be trading at a premium to par because four is more than five. But when it goes from a low interest, when the market interest rate goes from low to high, or from lower to higher, the bond values go down. When the market interest rate goes from higher to lower, bond prices go up. There's an inverse relationship. And that's what this market risk, this interest rate risk is, is all about. Your, your, your company, your client has a portfolio of bonds. There's a yield curve, right? If suddenly, and it's all U.S. dollar nominated bonds, for example, suddenly the Federal Reserve comes up and goes, wow, we're worried about inflation. We need to slow down economic growth. We're going to increase the Fed funds rate by 50 basis points. What's going to happen? That yield curve goes up, your bond, the whole portfolio goes down in value. And what we're going to look at later is how sensitive is your bond portfolio to movement and interest rates. Okay. Now, I'll just write it, you know, you can kind of look into it on your own, but the, each of these cash flows will have to be discounted to the present value. There'll be a discount rate applied to it, and then you sum up those present values to get the value of the bond. You want to do one example? Yeah. Let's do one example. Let's do the example of six uh, percent. So now we got a discount factor. Here we have the present value. Anybody know what the present value formula is? Present value equals the future value divided by 1 plus the discount rate raised to the t, which is the number of periods. Okay? So in this case, in year one, if the discount, and the market interest rate is like is your discount factor, okay? So the discount factor is going to be 1 over. 1.06 raised to the power of 1. This is just one period. And if you were to do that in your calculator, Here, 1 over 1.06, that's 1 plus 6%, right? 6% is a decimal, 0 0.06 raised to the power of 2. So on my little calculator, I go 1.06 raised to the power of 2 equals inverse times 50 equals 44.50. One point zero six raised to the power of three. One over one point zero six raised to the power of four. One over one point zero six raised to the power of five. Of course, your calculator is now right. You can have functions. You can go uh, term five years, future value a thousand, discount rate six percent, compute present value, and it'll do this for you. Present value factor that's more than than one, you made a mistake. Right? Because we know that one divided by 1.06 is going to be less than one, correct? 1.98. raised to power. You got glasses there for a reason, you know. 1.06 raised to the power of four <laughs> equals that. Inverse times 30, 
So, if I own that bond and you wanted to buy it from me and the market rate's a 6%, you would say, I'm not paying any more than that. Right? You'd be like, no, no, I've div divided this at a discount because I need a 6% return. So, this would be the, this would be the uh, value of that bond. Now, anybody know the bond trade is how they would quote that? In the bond market, when they're quoting the price of a bond, 95.7%. Right, they say 95.732%. Right, because what is it? It's 95.732% of, of the face value. Face value. So the bond price is quoted as a percentage of the face value. And then they start throwing in terms like pips and basis it's points, nice. and then you find that pips and basis points are the same thing, and you go, well, you just use one. Yeah. Well, the Europeans like pips. <laughs> All right. Market interest rates, bond prices inversely related. Everybody has this? Anybody going to run home and change the inputs and do the calculation and then put yourself to sleep? That's in the U.S. market. That's in the global market. What about the behavior marketplace? Do we have interest rate risk? You better believe it. I work at Family Guardian, and we've got a lot of fixed rate liabilities. And insurance companies as a whole have a lot of fixed rate liabilities backed by variable rate government bonds. And the decrease in prime is like you know, it's like yeah, that's the last thing we want to hear, right? So we're constantly trying to find investments where we can convert variable rate into fixed rate. So, you know, and unfortunately, I mean, in my lifetime, I've only seen the Bahamian government issue one fixed rate issue, and that was last year. They did a fixed rate like 4.3%, which was less than the 4.75 prime plus. It's a little spread, but I'd almost prefer they give me the fixed rate, you know. But um, fixed rate at fixed rate at a lower 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 coupon. Banks, right? And the banks don't have nearly the interest rate risk that insurance companies do because they have variable rate liabilities and variable rate assets. Okay? For the most part. Alright. I did I did the writing. Miguel did all that graphic work. <laughs> Nothing else. I don't, know, I don't have enough time in my day to find that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Though. All right. Next, we are looking at currency risk. All right. Currency risk is the risk that the fair value or future cash flows of financial instrument will fluctuate because of changes in foreign exchange rate rates. You got 
you have a U.S. bank, but they've got euro exposure. You've got a U.S. denominated client who's got yen exposure. Um, you live in the Bahamas, and our dollar is fixed to the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar devalues. Guess what happens to our prices? They all go up. Right? The U.S. dollar gets weak. Gas and fuel goes up. The cost of food goes up. So we, we ourselves are exposed to currency risk just as consumers because our currency is fixed in the U.S. dollar. That's pretty straightforward. Commodity risk, basically just the same exact thing, but this time for commodity. Commodity risk is the risk that the fair value of the future cash flows of financial instrument will fluctuate because of changes in commodity prices. Okay. How does the investment community think of gold? Is it a commodity or a currency? I think almost like a lot of people think it was almost it's a commodity, right? It's used in it's used in things, but it's also considered like the ultimate currency. You think back in the day when the US dollar was backed by gold, right? People started converting the dollars to gold. I said, hold on now, it's enough of that. <laughs> we don't want your we don't want our dollars to be backed by gold. We want our money to be backed by uh, the market's comfort in the economy's ability to generate enough wealth so the government can tax its citizens to repay its debt. So it's all just a matter of it's trust. Right? When you hold when you buy US dollars, you're basically saying, um, either I can light this, light a fire, or I don't know what you can do, you know, uh, but really what you're saying is I have faith, trust that the U.S. economy will continue to generate sufficient wealth to allow its government to live up to its obligations and it won't default. And that's the same with any, any paper currency, right? It's an IOU that they give you, right? They promise to pay you back. Next, we're going to look at other, other price risk. So other price risk is the risk of the fair value or future cash flows of a financial instrument will fluctuate because of changes in market prices. Other than those arising from interest rate risk, currency risk, or commodity risk. Whether those changes are caused by factors specific to the individual financial instrument or its issuer, or factors affecting all similar financial instruments traded in the market. Think of you know a global event, an exogenous event, an exogenous event that impacts all prices, right? I mean uh, the 9/11 terror attack, um, uh, what else uh, recent? That's really the big one, wasn't it? The housing the collapse in the U.S. housing market, right? I mean everybody was impacted by that, regardless if you were exposed to the U.S. market or not because indirectly you were probably invested somewhere else that in turn had an exposure to the U.S. market that was impacted and so on, right? Do you think that the um, recent Boston massacre had a big impact on the U.S. market? Yeah, I don't think so, no. I mean, it was... Um, I think they did such a good job of kind of bringing it to resolution and it turned out not to be a global entity, it turned out to be two idiots. Two individuals. Now, granted, I'm sure they had some help along the way, but it wasn't this. 9/11 was a, a global terror scheme orchestrated by Al Qaeda that led to what a war that's continuing today: the invasion of Afghanistan. And then I don't know why they went into Iraq. But that's another story, right? I don't know the U.S. man sometimes. Anyway. When you got the whole world up behind you, you go into Afghanistan, you got countries that haven't fought a war in 50 years go in and support you. And then you turn around and go, thanks guys, you guys deal with that one that we started, we're gonna go over here and create one over here. And now the US is broke. I mean, the amount of money they've wasted. So, as far as currency risk, as far as the, the ability, the strength of the US dollar, it's, it's a far weaker currency than it was before the invasion.
page memorized. <laughs> Types of interest rate risk. So you've got the shape of the yield curve. Is everybody familiar with kind of the normal shape of the yield curve? Right? For example, let me just give you a simple example. Um, if I promise to give you a dollar a year from now, or 10 years from now, are you willing to take the same rate of return? 10 years versus a dollar, a year versus 10 years? No, there's greater risk that I won't be able to pay my do that dollar to you in 10 years, right? So I demand a higher yield, a higher rate of return. So the normal shape of a yield curve is just that. That's what you call chord risk. So if this is time, and this is yield, the normal shape of a yield curve is kind of this shape. All right? The further out into the time of the maturity, the higher the rate of return I require. Now, if that's normal, but the market is not interest rate, the, the yield curve is not normal right now, the, normal, the, the yield curve is flat. What's kind of the risk? That in time it's going to want to go back to normal, right? If this is not normal, then one would expect you know, time is going to return to a normal shape. So the risk is that the yield on the long end of the curve is going to shift back to, a, to its normal shape. And why is that a risk? If yield goes up, those bonds prices go down. So if you have exposure on the long end of the yield curve, and it's a flat, flat yield curve, there's kind of an additional risk to consider that when it, if the shape of the yield curve returns to a normal state, you may suffer a, a, a decrease in bond prices. On the short end, kind of the reverse is the same, right? If, if the yields on the short end of the curve return to more normal levels, then bond prices go up. Then you've even got on occasion you get you know, an inverse yield curve, which is uh, kind of the normal, the normal situation taken to the next extreme. Okay? Now, all we're having here is we're having basically we're talking shifts in the yield curve, right? I'll wrote to the yield curve. Um, so I'll talk about here shifts in the yield curve. So if you have a normal yield curve, there's a risk the yield curve is going to shift. A more normal shape. On the long end, you're going to have exposure if you're long, right? The bond prices may go down. On the short end, bond prices may go up. Um, what was the Federal Reserve trying to? I'm trying to remember what they were doing recently. Like. I think there was a point where the, the U.S. yield curve was like, I don't know, it was like that. What were they doing? They were trying to get it to a more normal level. So what would they have been doing? They would have been issuing, issuing bonds at a given maturity rate level, right? Bond prices would go down. No, no. Buying up. Yeah. They were, the, the Federal Reserve is actively buying, buying back their bonds at this level, right? If they buy the bonds, the price is going up. And if the price is going up, the yield is coming down because they wanted to get, they wanted to change the shape of the yield curve, right? Something like that. So they were buying, they were, you know, targeting a certain, certain maturity dates to kind of force the, the yield down. Quantitative easing is on that. And um, that also, what, what happens when the, when, the, when the Federal Reserve buys their bonds back? That's a way of injecting cash into the economy, right? Now, usually, financial institutions own these bonds, and so now they're saying, okay, give us our bonds back, and here you got a bunch of cash. Uh, ideally, what we'd like you to do with that cash is we'd like you to do some capital expenditures, we'd like you to employ more people. What's happened in the U.S. A lot of the corporations said, 
going to hold my cash because I'm not comfortable yet with investing in capital expenditure. I'm not comfortable yet in expanding the workforce because we're not comfortable that the economy has turned around yet. So a lot of U.S. companies are sitting on a bunch of cash uh, and they prefer to sit on the cash versus invest. Now, uh, you can talk about yield curve shifts okay, and non-parallel twists. Well, let's talk about parallel, a parallel shift first. So, in the Bahamas, I like to think, you know, we have to, we have to come up with a proxy for the yield curve in the Bahamas, right? Because we don't have fixed rate instruments that are actively trading to get yields. We don't really have a secondary market. So what I think, what I like to do is take the U.S. yield curve and then apply a premium because our government debt is rated A3 by Moody's and triple B plus, I think, by S&P. And the U.S. is rated either double A plus or triple A. And there's a spread, right, between those rates. So what you can do is take the U.S. yield curve and just bump it up by that spread and come up with a proxy for the Bahamian yield curve. But let's look at the, um, the U.S. yield curve. So let's suppose the U.S. yield curve is like this. The Federal Reserve comes out and the market isn't really expecting this, right? The Federal Reserve comes out and lowers the Fed prime Fed rate by 50 basis points. Okay. Uh, bond prices are going to now go up, and the yield is going to come down. So you can have this parallel shift, where the yield curve moves the same amount at all on all points of the yield curve. Okay. And that was great if you were long bonds, right? They lowered rates, bond prices go up. In the last you know, number of years in the US, if you've been in bonds, you've been very, very happy. Right now, if you're in bonds in the US, you're going, when do I get out? Because there isn't much upside anymore, right? Because the yields are so low. Then the dilemma is, well, if I do get out, what do I do with it? All right. So that would be the case of a parallel shift down. You can have a parallel shift up. You can have uh, a twist, right? This is the yield curve. The yield curve kind of goes like that, right? So uh, this goes up, that goes down, it kind of twists. And then you can have a non parallel shift, right? Or this shifts by less than that. So all these different varieties of shifts. Has anybody heard of the term duration? The duration of a bond? It's pretty close to the term of a bond, right? How, how much time till it matures. It's not exactly the same, but it's somewhat close. Um, Kind of look at the relationship between the yield and the price of a bond. Right? It's not a straight line. It's actually it's kind of a relationship like that. Okay. What duration is is a measure of the slope, depending on where you are. Right. So let's suppose right now this is where the yield is, and this would be the, the price. Right. So yield one, price one. And you want to know how sensitive the price of the bond is to changes in the yield. Duration will give you an estimate for small changes, but it's a linear relationship. So it's like it gives you a line that's tangent to that point. Mm -hmm. Remember, maybe we're trigonometry and geometry. Mm -hmm. So it's tangent to that point. So duration for, for relatively small changes in yield, it's a pretty good estimate of what's going to happen to the price. It's basically saying if the yield goes out here, price is going to drop to there, the yield goes up to here, the price is going to go over here, right? P2, P3. So for small changes, it's good. But when you, as you start to get larger and larger changes, it starts to become a worse, a poorer and poorer estimate, right? Because the real shape or the real relationship is this curve, uh, concave, Convex, concave, is this concave? Concave shape, but it's a linear relationship. 
Convexity is where you take the duration and you kind of you manipulate it. You add another element to it, and it kind of forces the duration curve, the duration equation to go from being linear to concave. It almost imagine like it starts to wrap the this estimate around, so it gets closer and closer to the actual yield curve. So when you, if you want to know small and the impact of small changes on the yield, if you want to know the impact of small yield changes on the bond price, duration is a good estimate. But if you want to start to get an idea of larger yield changes and the impact, you need to bring in convexity as well. Okay. Hedging interest rate risk can be done using interest rate futures, interest rate options, interest rate swaps. All right. Examples of currency risk. That's the risk of receiving less than the domestic currency when invested in a bond issue that makes payments in a foreign currency. This risk applies to coupon payments and the principal payment of maturity. So, um, here in the Bahamas, for, for you and I, it's very difficult to do this. You have clients at the bank, you know, or maybe uh, if you're with the central bank reviewing the bank who has clients that, that have this risk, okay? But you're in the Cayman Islands, and you can invest your money in anything you want with no capital controls, but that'd be nice. You could expose yourself to all the currency risk you want. You walk in your bank and say, I want a Japanese yen account. Okay, so that's uh, currency risk, and then also talk about transaction risk, and that's the risk of receiving less or paying more in domestic currency when entering into a business contract to receive payment or take delivery in a foreign currency at a specified date in the future. Hedging of these risks can be done using currency forward contracts or currency future contracts. Let me give you an example of a currency forward. Can I Let me give you an example. BEC says, man, we need another generator. We need more capacity. So um, they enter in a contract with Siemens in Germany, and they're going to make this 100 megawatt, megawatt turbine or whatever. I don't know if that's the right terminology. It sounds good. And Siemens says, well, you know, we only start manufacturing these once the order is placed. So once you sign on the dotted line and the contract is in place, then we start building this generator. But we can't deliver it until a year from now, right? That's how long it'll take. Uh, and the price is 100 million euros, okay? So from Siemens standpoint, their costs are based in euro. They're gonna get paid in euros, so they're happy. From BEC standpoint, they what? They have US dollars, they don't have euros. They have they have no idea what the, year, the exchange is going to be a year from now, so they've got currency risk. Seeing that BC doesn't even hedge its fuel costs, uh, they definitely um, are not in the market of speculating. Well, actually, yeah, they are in the market of speculating on currency. They don't realize it because they don't hedge their fuel costs. They are speculating on currency. But what they would do is, you know, we're not, in the, we're not in the business of speculating on currency prices. We're in the business of generating electricity. So today, I want to know what I'm going to have to pay a year from now. I want to eliminate my currency risk. So they enter into a forward contract, all right? Where they, they enter into a contract where they agree to buy 100 million euro at a given price in US dollars today. The question is, how do you determine what that forward rate will be? Well, it's just a very straightforward formula that the currency traders plug in. Add in their little spread, wow, done. You've now got a you've now got a forward contract on your on your on your books. Okay? Now between now and then, right, some people use it as, as a way to speculate on currency move movements. It can be in or out of the money, right? Between now and maturity. And if it's in the money, maybe you could, what you do is you enter into a, a contract that's opposite to that and lock in your return. When I was at UVP, there was a guy, a manager in Switzerland, man, he loved doing this. He was like, every day, 
on half million forward documents, on half million, but he, he'd have like, you know, 20 different forward contracts on his client's book, and it all whittled down to he'd be like up $5,000 or something now. But we're making fees, so I don't know if Mark does it long the spread. All right. The spread or the... Because, you know, you, you, you would add the spread to that before you, you know, yeah, well, get the funds. Usually the trade... Is standard or... But UVP, they had their group in, in Switzerland, Geneva, mm -hmm. and you call up and say, I want, a, I want a forward contract, blah, 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 and they say, well, okay, the rate is X. Now, I'm going to show you the formula that gives you the rate before they're spread, okay. and they, in turn, would add a spread to cover their fees. But um, the forward rate equals the spot times... So this forward rate is going to be less, this is going to be U.S. dollars per euro, okay? Mm -hmm. This part is going to be U.S. dollars per euro, all right? Times one plus the interest rate in the U.S. divided by one plus the interest rate in the euro land, all raised to the power of t. Now. If U.S. interest rates are higher than European interest rates, do you think the forward rate is going to be more or less than the spot? Mm -hmm. If, if U.S. interest rates mm -hmm. are more than the European interest rates, mm -hmm. we're going to have 1 plus a number divided by 1 plus a number. Now this number on top is going to be more than the number on the bottom, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and therefore, this is going to be greater than 1? Yeah. All right. And therefore, something greater than one times the spot equals a forward rate that's greater than the spot. Mm -hmm. If U.S. interest rates are less than the European interest rates, this is going to be less than one, and therefore the forward is going to be less than the spot. So when you start to think about currency risk, um, and really, you know, one of the key things that drives what's going to happen to the exchange rate is how these inter the interest rates differ between the two jurisdictions, right? Mm -hmm. Like if they don't change, if the, if the spread between their interest rates remains the same, uh, there's other factors, but for the most part, you're not going to have a lot of volatility in the currency rate, probably, unless you have something like, uh, you know, no. So suddenly the European Central Bank lowers rates in Europe to stimulate the economy. The forward rate. They lowered their rates. This would become a greater, mm -hmm. even more than one. This would be more than that. Mm -hmm. And we won't go through it, but this formula is all about to eliminate interest rate arbitrage. In other words, you should be indifferent between um, keeping your money in US or converting your US to Euro and bringing it back to U.S. in the forward rate. Uh, well, because, for example, if it, either I can hold my U.S. and, and so put it in the bank at the U.S. rate, and at the end of one year I've got my principal plus the interest. The other option is I convert my U.S. to Euro at the spot, I invest it at the Euro rate, at the end of one year I've got my Euro, uh, but I, if it, at the beginning of that period, if I can lock in a forward rate, that allows me to convert back to U.S. It gives me more U.S. than I would if I didn't. Then I do that, right? And everybody would do it. But to make sure that that's not the case, the forward rate takes away that that opportunity to have this risk-free return. All right. So, really, all I want you to know is that. So this is the formula. All right. Let's look at the Bahamian example. What's the U.S. dollar euro rate right now? We'll use 130 because it's brown. All right. And the US rate is for one year 0.5. It's low. I don't know what it is, but it's like 1005. Europe is a little higher. We'll go like that. I mean, I don't know. Something like that. Raised to the power of 1. Okay. Well, we know that this is going to be less than 1, right? 
1.005 is less than 1.0075. So before you even do the calculation, we know that the forward rate is going to be less than 130. If you get something more than 130, you made a mistake. Okay? So. Now with interest rates as low as they are, right, you start to have a rather minimal impact. forward equals 1.2968. All right. Now, is that a good deal or not for BEC? Well, yeah, man. BEC is in the, it's the business of, of, of generating power. They don't want to speculate. So they block that in. They, now, they know exactly what that generator is going to cost in U.S. dollars. It's going to cost $129,660,000. 129,680,000 US for that 100 million euro generator, right? And now they can move on from there and now they can figure out how to raise the money, right? So, but when interest rates were much higher, you started to get ratios that were much greater. You could have uh, bigger swings in the forward and spot rate. If this was for six months and not for a year, what would this be? Five, right? Mm -hmm. Six months is half a year. So if this was, you know, for six months, it would be 0 0.5. If it was for three months, 0 0.25, and so on, right? six months from now, focus on keeping your cost down, and boom. Now the risk is that you have to deliver. Because if you're the farmer, you actually got the actual commodity. Now, as a farmer, what you can do, let's suppose you realize your harvest is not going to be as much as you thought it would be, you can actually start taking counter positions to that future contract. Instead of buying it, you can sell it. You can eliminate some of that, that exposure. You may take a loss along the way, but there's ways to do it. Um, Still, its its parent company is, is um, under Basel III. So what, what's Switzerland? What are they? They're going to Basel III. Well, they're going to not there yet either. They're, they're going to Basel right? Yeah. So if you're if you're looking at a Swiss bank, the branch of a Swiss bank or a subsidiary of a Swiss bank, mm -hmm. then you need to become familiar with Basel III as well, right? Yes. So these um Basel I. Well, some of the shortcomings of Basel I. Um, Capital required 
did not mirror the bike's true risk profile. Uh, it was too simple for advanced bikes and flexible against new developments. It covers only credit and market risks, only quantitative in nature, limited recognition of capital. That's my source. Fernando Vega. Uh, Basel II objectives, greater emphasis on bank's own assessment of risk, comprehensive framework for credit, market, and operational risk, uh, encourages rigorous bank supervision, ensures market transparency, disclosure, uh, more risk sensitive, better aligned regulatory capital with actual risk exposure. All right, next we go on Basel II and the financial crisis. In defense of Basel II, right? So what what people thought it did did well? Uh, oh, it was only recently implemented. So it's not fair to judge it. Okay. In the U.S., it only applies to the top tier banks operating internationally. Most of the banking system is exempt. What are there, like ten thousand banks in the U.S.? So it's a tremendous. Maybe there's fewer now, but there used to be. Whereas the Canadian banking sector is about seven, you know, of which five are huge. Fortunately, well, some people don't like it, but I think from a regulatory standpoint, back then our banking sector was dominated by Canadian banks, not U.S. banks. So imagine if you know our banks. I don't know. Imagine some of the banks that went, went belly up, and they were here, and we had our bosses and them. I don't know. It's just anyway. Fortunate there was a Canadian Canadian's approach to it versus the U.S. approach. Uh, not enough attention given to remuneration packages and investment banking out of the management boards. The transparency of a bank's risk profile. Management's true understanding of both the bank's risk profile and its risk positions. That's in defense. Anyway. <laughs> <All right. laughs> All right, now we're going to, um, boy. Now we're looking more at IFRS, right? We're looking at Basel. Let's move through this as pain, painlessly as possible. So how does I, IFRS, and most of the, bank, most of the uh, jurisdictions around the world now are IFRS based? I think even the U.S. is adopting a lot of the IFRS. And actually, the IRS is adopting some of the U.S. Uh, GAAP. So it's kind of a merging of the two. Sensitivity analysis. Uh, so th this is kind of what they're saying to their auditors, right? When you go in and you're reviewing I guess uh, uh, an entity, unless an entity complies with paragraph 41 now, IFRS comes out with updates, not complete rewrites, but you know, updates and amendments. So we obviously need to get the latest IFRS um, uh, guidelines to see whether it's exactly paragraph 41 or paragraph 40, right? So this may have changed over the, over the last uh, year. Um, so if you look at, let's see, do we have paragraph 41? Let's read paragraph 41 on the next page. If an entity prepares sensitivity analysis such as value at risk that reflects interdependence between risk variables and uses it to manage financial risks, it may use that sensitivity analysis in place of the analysis specified in paragraph 40. You think they'd have them reversed, eh? It sounds like 40 should have come first and then 40, okay. Uh, the entity shall also disclose an explanation of the method used in preparing such a sensitivity analysis and of the main parameters and assumptions underlying the data provided. Also, an explanation of the objective of the method used and of limitation that may result in the information. 
information not fully reflected, reflecting the fair value of the assets and liabilities involved. Let's go back to 40 and see what 40 says. So basically an entity is supposed to provide a sensitivity analysis of each type of market risk to which the entity is exposed at the end of the reporting period, showing how profit or loss and equity would have been affected by changes in the relevant risk variable that were reason reasonably possible at that date. The methods and assumptions used in, the, in, the preparing, the, in preparing the sensitivity analysis and changes from the previous period in the, me in the methods and assumptions used and the reasons for such changes, right? So that's, that's often very revealing, you know? Oh, well, what are the methods and assumptions you used? Oh, well, here they are. That seems sensible. But last year, they were this. Why did you change from this to that? Well, we want a good result again, so we had to change it to get the result we wanted. Right? No, I mean, so that's kind of a red flag. If, if from year to year you start to see methods and, and assumptions being changed, it's quite often it's being done not for the best of reasons. It's being done to get a result that they want. All right, so if you see that, and you know, maybe even a request, you know, a series of the last three years, what were the methods and assumptions used? And request the table. I want to see, see it. These are the methods. Why did you change from the uh, a market multiple approach, looking for similar companies and what are they what are they trading at, to a discounted cash flow approach? Right. Now, this kind of cash flow approach allows you to allows for a lot more what should I say uh, uh, subjectivity. A lot of variables that can be debated and argued of what they should be. And, get a result that you want. So there's like a higher, I think it's um, when you're doing a fair value analysis according to IFRS and, and US GAAP now, it's a three tier process. Uh, number one, like the best would be a quoted price. So shares of Citibank, it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the closing price was what? Fine. That's easy, right? That's very easy to validate. There's no manipulation. It is what it is. Then level two would be, well, um, we're a private bank, but we're kind of similar to these banks that trade, and therefore we looked at the price to EBITDA multiples that they were at, and we adjusted them slightly, we, you know, brought the multiples down a bit, because we're a little riskier, we're private, we're not public, and that's how we came up with our multiple, right? Then the third, or the least easy to support would be, say, a discounted cash flow model, or the entity goes, well, here are our projections for the next five years. We discount on the back to the present value. Well, first of all, there's the projections that were assumed. The discount rate that was used. The terminal growth rate assumptions. There's all these assumptions that go into that calculation. And we can sit here and argue back and forth what is the right number to use. Right? They can have their support for this. We'll have our support. So it's harder to defend. Um, so that's why it's important to to know historically what the methods and assumptions used were, and whether or not there are any changes from year to year. Uh, let's go forward two more. See, if you missed last week, man, I think last week people here were like, boy, it's kind of boring. And after this week, they're looking back and going, man, this first week was good, eh? All right. Paragraph 42. And the sensitivity analysis disclosed in, in accordance with paragraph 40 or 41 are unrepresentative of a risk inherent in a financial instrument. For example, because the year and exposure does not reflect the exposure during the year, the entity shall disclose the fact and the reason it believes the sensitivity analysis is unrepresentative. All right, I mean, you know, year end financial statements are as of a given point in time, and things may have been completely different during the course of the year, and their argument hey, this isn't fair. Um, uh, it was a short term fluctuation in the share price, you know, like uh, irrational exuberance in the market. I don't know. Um, we don't think that this, this downturn in value is, is, is long-term or even medium-term. We think it's just a short-term phenomenon. 
therefore we think that the value during the entire year should be reflected. So maybe how about a mid-year value versus the end of year value? And that's where the auditor and or the reviewer and the company go back and forth. People throw stuff just, at each other and just to reflect on that, I I know there was a period when a lot of institutions shifted from the gap analysis to this. What was right. the the logic behind that? Um what was or the logic? This is more an updated approach to, to looking at something. I believe IFRS is not as I'm trying to remember the term now, it's it's not as rule based. Like I think gap is very this is how it is. Okay, that's and IFRS allowed it for a little, little for flexibility, a little subjectivity. Okay. Um, and yeah, and, and it's very US centric. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you, you look all through Europe, IFRS, the Bahamas, all through the Caribbean, yeah. Australia, New Zealand. I remember the period when they, a lot of them were changing. Right. Because they had some gap. Canada is now IFRS. It used to be Canadian gap. Now they're completely IFRS. Yeah. It was really an attempt to come with a global uh, standard. standard. Okay. So that, and like the CFA Institute supports the adoption of a global standard because if you're analyzing companies from different jurisdictions, yeah. The financial statements are being produced oh, based on different guidelines. Mm -hmm. You got apples and oranges, right? Mm -hmm. You really can't be sure what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So you can't compare. So the idea is that if you have a, a global standard, the flow of capital will be more efficient, mm -hmm. right? Because now we can, uh, there's less risk of investing in Japanese companies. These are very difficult to, to analyze their financial statements. Probably still somewhat difficult. Um, but now, you know, you know that if you're looking at a Canadian bank, a German bank, and a Brazilian bank, an Australian bank, if they're all being audited using the same guidelines, you've got some, you've got four financial statements that are easier to compare. Mm -hmm. And I guess it supports Azul's um, approach to consolidated supervision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's part of the globalization process, right? Uh, we don't like it. This is the doc shows. <laughs> the document has been signed. <laughs> All right. Oh, did I go for it? Okay. Uh, let's just read through this. Once again, referring to a given paragraph, you know, a given section in IFRS. That said, you know, if you get the, the latest version of IFRS, you simply go to the section that deals with market risk. Okay. Um, so this particular paragraph 40 requires a sensitivity analysis for each type of market risk to which the entity is exposed. There are three types of market risk, interest rate risk, currency risk, and other price risk. They've included commodity risk and other price risk. Okay. Other price risks may include risks such as equity price risk, commodity price risk, prepayment risk. Do we know what prepayment risk is? That's like you have a mortgage, right, sometimes? You have a prepayment. Well, imagine I'm an, you're an investor, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got this nice bond that's got a nice fixed coupon, 5%, but now the market interest rates are 2%. And you're feeling good about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I'm getting five. Well, the entity that's paying you five says, you know what, I'm tired of being stupid. I can issue a new bond at two, pay you out. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden I'm not earning five, I got cash in my hand, I got to reinvest it. I got, pre I got paid back earlier than expected. So that's also reinvestment risk. Mm -hmm. um, but prepayment risk would apply. I think actually your idea of a mortgage is, is yeah, right. That's one area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the bank thinks it's got this nice 20 year mortgage on the books. Mm -hmm. Guy walks in after year five and goes, wow, hey, like, uh oh. Now, what do we do with all this cash? We're going to relend it. Um, so, prepayment risk is the risk of being paid out earlier than expected. Uh, reinvestment risk is that risk that now you have to reinvest your proceeds at a lower rate of interest. Residual value risk a leaser of motor cars that writes residual value guarantees exposed to residual value risk. <laughs> the lease 
purchaser of motor cars and writes residual value guarantees. Okay. We'll all go home and research that one. <laughs> Risk, because we don't have a lot of leasing of vehicles here. Right? No. No. I think Nassau Motors doesn't have yeah. Exactly. But they're prohibitive men. If you watch the commercials in the U.S. and be like, you know, zero down, $199 lease for a BMW or something like that. <laughs> Got a lease it over there and bring it over here. <laughs> probably violating some behavior laws. You won't have a title. I won't have a title then. You can't do it anyway. Uh, I just put one of those, those opaque things over my license plate so no one can read my license. <laughs> and have all my tinted up and all that. <laughs> They had a police, police uh, block on Shirley Street on the way here to see. Once you pass Camp Road or Fowl Street, right there in the middle of the road, so you're kind of like uh, <laughs> stuck. There's risk. That's that. Mm -hmm. Idiot risk. <laughs> Crime risk. Uh, the yield curve. Market interest rates. So we talked about some of these earlier, right? The risk of a parallel or non-parallel shift in the yield curve, foreign exchange rates, price and equity instruments, prices of equity instruments, and market prices of the markets. All right. So IFRS requires sensitivity analysis to show the effect on profit or loss and equity of reasonable change, possible changes in the relevant risk variable. For example. Relevant risk variables may include prevailing market interest rates for interest-sensitive financial instruments such as a variable rate loan, or currency rates and interest rates for currency, foreign currency financial instruments such as foreign currency bonds. A little bit of overlap with what we talked about. But expected, right? One was kind of the basil and now we're dealing with IFRS. For interest rate risk, the sensitivity analysis might show separately the effect of a change in market interest rates on interest income and expense, other line items of profit or loss, such as trading gains or losses, and when applicable equity. An entity might disclose a sensitivity analysis for interest rate risk for each currency in which the entity has material exposures to interest rate risk. So this next next slide talks in the second uh, paragraph, second bullet point. <coughs> kind of the first time it's come up, but it talks about options that remain in or out of the money for a chosen change in the risk variable. Who's familiar with options? All right, let's look at a call option and a put option. Just the basic structure of an option. Call up and like put down. Mm -hmm. Call up, put down. <laughs> if, yeah, you, you, you buy a call if you think the price is going to go up, mm -hmm. and you buy a put if you think the price is going to go down. You write a call if you think it's going to go down. You write a put if you think it's going to go up. What do you say? All right. Let's see. I got options. Okay. This is a call option. And this is just your plain vanilla call option. What is a call option? A call option gives the buyer of the option the right, but not the obligation to buy a given security at a given price over a given period of time. So it's, it's, a, it's a right, but not an obligation. In other words, you can pay, you pay a premium for this right, and when the, if it expires, you lose your premium. And you're not obligated to actually execute the option. All right? So, uh, All right. 
profit. This is the price. This right here represents zero profit. Okay? Now you pay a premium to have this option. So you start out at a negative position. All right, that's your premium. This negative position is your pre premium. Okay? Now, that's one of the key terms that we need to know. You've got strike price. Uh, you've got in the money. At the money. At the money, mm -hmm. out of the money, uh, all break even. All right. So this this call option has a strike price of ten dollars. Okay. Which is here. So this is ten dollars. Okay. You have the right, but not the obligation to buy. So you have the right, but not the obligation to buy at ten dollars. As soon as it goes above ten dollars, now you're in the money. All right, because you could you could buy at ten and sell at the higher price. But until you get to that point, until you get to the ten, you you you've lost your premium. Okay. But as soon as you get to ten, then you start to you're in the money, right? So initially what happens is your loss is being reduced and reduced until the price is so much higher than your strike price that it more than offsets your premium, or it offsets your premium. And this is all profit, right? This is profit. Uh, let's see. You're now in the money. This is your break even. Or at the money, maybe that's the same, eh? at the money, I can't remember. At the money, in the money. I don't usually use at the money, I use break even. They use at the money. At the money? Who are they? <laughs> they are some people with the whole options. No, man. <laughs> maybe, all right. So I think at the money and break even, you can think of this. I think these are the same. So this is at the money, or in the money now, right? You're starting to cover some of your premium. This is your break even. And now this is profit. If the share price never gets above 10, then of course you just let it expire worthless, you, you lose your premium. As soon as it gets above 10, now you're starting to, you're at the money and now you're starting to uh, reduce some of your premium. So you would, you would still sell here, right? Because now you're only gonna lose this amount. You'd sell here, you're only gonna lose that amount. At this point, you're losing this amount. Uh, the benefit of this is unlimited upside potential. The share price could go, you know, Apple went to what? $700, whatever, right? So if you were fortunate enough to do this, come down now. So that's a call option. All right. The right, but not the obligation to buy a given security, a given security at a given price for a given period of time. So this, this option could be for three months, six months, a year, two years. Needless to say, the more time that's left in the life of the option, the higher the premium you have to pay. This is a greater likelihood that at some point it'll be in the money. Okay. So imagine you got a stock whose price is very volatile. It goes way up, goes way down, goes way up. Do you think you'd pay a higher premium or a lower premium for a volatile stock? higher premium because there's a greater likelihood that at some point it's going to go in the money, right? And it may, may not be there for long, it may come back down and be out of the money, but as soon as it goes into the, you know, goes up in price rather sharply, you can sell off your option, you can take an opposite position, right? And uh, lock in your profit. So that's, that's a call option. So out of the money would be even the price? From here down it's out of the money, yeah. But if it's still, even though it's out of the money, the option still may have value, right? Because if there's still a lot of time left, there's, there's a 
potential for it to get in the money. Yeah. Now, the premium, as it gets more and more out of the money, the premium goes down and down, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's less and less chance it's going to be in the money. But there may still be some value. Mm -hmm. All right? So you may be able to sell your option, even though you may decide, I, I don't want to hold it anymore, I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a smaller bit back. You still take a loss. All right. Same, same security, same price, but now we wanted to have a, a put option. I get to put this to somebody else, right? I have the right to sell, but not, I have the right but not the obligation to sell at a given price for a given period of time. Okay? And this is our break even. This is our premium. It's just a 10 that starts in the money. We got profit. Man, remember all the good, good old chalk ball? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, you know, you're hoping the price is going to go below 10. Because now I get the right to sell at 10. But let's suppose I don't own it. I own, I, 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 I bought a put option, but I don't actually own the share. And now the share price goes to here. To five. If I wanted to actually deliver on the option, I go on the market and buy it at five, sell it, and sell it to you at ten. All right. But what usually happens is that if the price goes to ten, this option now has a value far in excess of the premium I paid, and I can actually sell it right and, and, and get the profit. So. Now, the investing experts can come up with a multitude of uh, complicated option strategies. And, you know, you sit there and look at it and go, say what? You know, I mean, blow your mind, right? But these are your basic, basic put option, basic call option. Have you come across that in some of your um, reviews, the central bank reviews of clients? If you, like locally, right, quite often companies will issue a bond, a preferred share, and they'll have a redeemable feature or a callable feature. Like I just saw a document of an issue that's going to come to market, probably not going to hit the market, it's just going to come to FamGuard and Kalina and Fidelity, private placement. But it's saying after, after year five, the issuer has the right to redeem. So they've given themselves an option. They have the, they have the right but not the obligation to redeem after year five. That's got a 20 year term. So they've actually, they've built in a, 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 a call option, right? They get the right, to, they have the right to buy it back from you at par. In theory, I should demand a higher rate of return on that investment because you've now, I've now got prepayment risk and then re reinvestment risk. But that's not quite how it works. They, they come up and go, here's the interest rate, here's the terms, we think. And you usually just accept it. You don't have a lot, a lot of other things to invest in. All right. It is fixed rate, though, which we insurance companies love. And I highly recommend it if you want the opportunity to share in such investments that you invest in mutual fund of one of the leading entities in the market. I won't say which one. Okay, we move on. Let's see. Oops. Is that bad? I mean, it's clearer, but it's not better, right? You still got to look at this, this uh, exciting material. But let's see what we got here. We talked about options previously. Um, Additional disclosure might include the terms and conditions of the financial instruments, right? So that op the options, because some, you know, you can have structured products, right? You can have uh, an investment bank creates a product for the client, mm -hmm. and you, as a reviewer, all you see is on the books that they've got so and so option, but you need to see the terms and conditions. And they 
to have a document that lays all that out that you would have to look into. Uh, the effect on profit and loss uh, if the term or condition were met. A description of how the risk is hedged. For example, an, ent an entity might acquire a zero cost interest rate caller that includes an out of the money leverage written option. I'm choking on that one. Right. So, zero cost interest rate caller that includes an out of the money leverage written option. Wow, an entity pays 10 times the amount of the difference between the specified interest rate caller as an inexpensive economic hedge against a reasonably possible increase in interest rates. However, the unexpectedly large decrease in interest rates might trigger payments upon the written option that, man, let's move on. <laughs> in other words, there's some damn complicated structures out there in securities. Right. I mean, I was at KPMG and we were valuing structured, structured products. I mean, we'd have to write. They want us. To, basically, what the auditors would love is I would sign off and say, "The fair value of this security is." And they can tick a box, and I can have all the risk. If it turns out that's not the case, so we we worded, you know, based on a review of uh, the following assumptions and methods used in the struggle. Oh, you know, you basically would. You wouldn't actually come out and say the fair value is. You'd say, that, you know, I think based on the fall, it's reasonable to assume the fair value may be within this falling range. You know, something like that. So, because uh, these things become almost impossible to actually measure accurately. So overview of market risk. Again, now we're looking at some of the other things that you would want to see disclosed, right? So you want to see reasons for lack of liquidity, and how the hedge, the equity hedge, how the equity hedges the risk. Uh, some other things to look for, the nature of the security, the extent of holding, the effect on profit and loss, and how the hedge, equity hedges the risk. The entity hedges the risk, sorry. Okay. Um, or whether they hedge it at all. the sources that were used in that section. Market risk session two. What? All right, let's do both these sessions in one go. Right, well, let's, let's get started with this. Uh, types of value at risk calculation methods, pros and cons of each method, comparing the methods and examples. This guy's a little more, at least it's a little more interesting, right? Now we've got some. <laughs> I didn't say it was interesting, I said it was more interesting. It's a relative statement. Or it's not as depressing. Is that... uh, value at risk, methodologies. Number one, variance, covariance. Multiples, multiplies uh, market value exposure by the standard deviation of price change. Historical data. Run the portfolio through actual historical data and computing the change that would have occurred. Monte Carlo, we mentioned that last week. This is a simulation program that running multiple simulations based on probability distributions for each of the market risk factors. Okay, so now we talk about that the normal distribution curve. Uh, you know, you run run ten thousand simulations. You get 10,000 outcomes, and you're going to get a density of outcomes, right? Have you, have you seen that commercial where the guy talks about, we ask people to, to put this, this sticker up on this board of the oldest person they've, they've ever known? Mm -hmm. You see that? And it, like a couple, not many, like in the 90s, then the 80s picks up, mm -hmm. 70s is definitely the peak, and 60s comes down, and then under 60s is very, very limited. It's mm -hmm. a distribution. It's a, it's kind of a, it's the distribution of, of, of ages that with people die. I mean, I don't know. It, it's not quite that. It's not that. What was the oldest person that, of all the people who do you know who died? How old were they? It says, what is the oldest person, the age of the oldest person you know? So some of these ages are people who are alive, but that was a distribution curve based on the ages of people. Uh, Monte Carlo would, in effect. 
you could put in variables like uh, percentage of population to get this, percentage of population, you know, and, and then it would spit out uh, all these different results. And you'd have like that on that commercial, you'd end up with a curve. And then you would have a, you know, the mean, and you would have an idea of uh, whether that distribution is dense or not, mm -hmm. right? In other words, what, how, how much, how much rely, how, to what extent can you rely on that mean value, right? How many standard deviations? Uh, if one standard deviation uh, gives you 60 something percent confidence that you'll have that value, then two standard deviations, let me get a 90, 93, 94 percent comfort that the value will be in this range, and then three standard deviations, 99.9% .9 that it'll be within this range. Right? We'll get to that actually, in case I wouldn't want you guys to miss out on that fun stuff. But it is useful, it's good. Uh, what are the pros of, of variance covariance? It's fast, relatively easy to implement, consistent measuring measurement tool, data sets are readily available, so like risk metrics is this program you can combine. Defines uh, what is low and high risk. Requires only portfolio level sensitivities. Uh, constant reference point for staff. What are some of the cons of variance covariance? Assumes normal distributions or distributions similar to normal which may understate the true value at risk. Remember we talked about fat tails, right? So just quickly for those who weren't here. Uh, so the hand as I gave you show you some distribution oh. curves, but in a normal distribution, you have this mean value, and the number of, of values that are on that are lower than it, you have the same number that are higher than it. Right? So the area on this side is the same as the area on that side. And that's a nice normal distribution. Variance covariance assumes that distribution. We know that that almost never is right, right? We know this almost never, I'm sure it probably never happens. So we know that their main assumption never happens. You can get close to it, right? So everything in life is about probability. There's no certainty really, right? Other than what taxes and death maybe. <laughs> and one could argue they're finding, they're trying to find cures for death now. Um, tax evasion, you can avoid your taxes, not anymore. Eh? Okay. So that's a normal distribution. Then what are we talking about? We're talking about um, uh, in reality, quite often the distribution is not that way. And we talk about long term capital management, these guys back in the 90s, geniuses, I mean, Nobel Prize winning mathematicians. They made a ton of money. They assume normal distribution, but in reality, there were there were fat tails, right? So you had this cluster of outcomes down here that, that very unlikely, but very costly they occurred, right? And guess what happened? They got hit with one of those, the Russian default of '98. They were betting. I forget what they, I forget, they were betting that. Um, I guess. Interest, Russian interest rates would go down. For some reason, the things would get better in Russia. And the reverse happened. They defaulted. So all this, all this Russian debt they had was now worthless. And they didn't have just have Russian debt. They had leveraged 100 times. So they, for every dollar they had, they borrowed 99 dollars. They put it all in that bet, and it went wrong. So they were done. They had to be bailed out by all the main banks in the U.S because there was a risk of a, a global financial crisis. Because every single major bank had lent these guys money. Because these guys were so good that everybody wanted to lend them money. They didn't, they, they, they lend money they didn't want. They're like, oh, I'll do you a favor. We'll borrow that, that million dollars from you, leverage up. So when they went under, all the big banks were, had exposure. The Federal Reserve had to call all the leaders of the main banks in and sit them down and say, guys, you are bailing them out. We're not bailing them out. Yes, you are. Let me tell you why. Because if you don't, these guys are going to go on. Remember that, that thing you got with them? And they owe you, and you owe them, and all. They did, it was all intertwined, right? So at the end of the day, they all, not all of them, I guess different extents, they had to bail these guys out to avoid a uh, 
almost like a, the, the uh, mortgage crisis, but it would have been in the late 90s. All right, <clears throat> so five tails, here we go. Assumes normal distributions or distributions similar to normal, which may understate the true value of risk. Does not capture fat tails. Input error. The variance covariance matrix is a co collection of estimates, uh, some of which have very large error terms, right? Typo. Oh. Did I do for? Yeah, there we go. Non stationary variables occurs when the, the variances and covariances across assets change over time. Difficult to estimate market liquidity. Does not revalue positions. Multiple time horizons cannot be incorporated. Complex or discontinuous payoffs cannot be accounted for. And loss estimates based on the selected confidence interval. Right, so you know you get to select the confidence interval. What do I want? Do I want 68% confidence? Do I want 95% confidence? Do I want 99.9% .9 confidence? Of course, the greater the confidence interval, the higher the potential loss, right? Because in that graph, right? If I want to be 99% sure that my loss estimate, the actual loss is going to fall within my plus or minus loss estimate, you know, you've got to be like way out here, right? You to capture 99% of the area under the graph. So now you have a very wide potential loss range, right? Okay. So if I don't want to have to write a note, oh, the potential loss is all the way out here, I may go, well, I like a one standard deviation confidence interval. So my, my maximum loss is this value. Right? Granted, I've only got 68% of the area covered. There's a lot of possible outcomes that I haven't considered. You as somebody going in and analyzing the methodology and assumptions will say, I don't know, but what would the potential loss be if you use two standard deviations? What would it be if you use three standard deviations? Okay. Um, historical simulations. What are the pros? Requires no assumption about distributions. So that whole issue of normal distribution doesn't become a, a factor. Relies on volatility and correlation embedded in selected time series. Captures fat tails, extreme events, and price change distribution, which are not captured in a normal distribution. Relatively easy to com compute and capture nonlinear risks. Okay. Those are the pros. Now, what are the cons? Well, if it's a historical simulation, right? The first thing you say is, you know, the past is no guarantee of the future. Relies on historical data. The past is not necessarily a good predictor of the future. We talk about random walk last week. Right. You know, quite often the best estimate of the next price is the last price. Because you have no idea what it is. Right. So. Uh, trends in time series data. If volatility is increasing over time, the value at risk estimate will underestimate true value at risk. So you're looking at a given point in time, right? Or you're looking at, I'm sorry, not a given point in time. You're looking at historical data, right? So you've got a series of prices, and you're looking at that period. But what's the trend? You know, the middle, the, the average is somewhere in here, right? But based on the trend, it's probably going to be like that. It doesn't capture that trend, right? So you, you're using this number, and you know be way off. Okay? Could be downward as well. Alright. Uh, data data intensive requires numerous time series. Alright, so sourcing the data, downloading the data, inputting the data, analyzing the data. So new assets and new markets cannot um, can't measure that, right? If you rely on historical data and it's a new product there is no historical data. Okay. Next, Monte Carlo simulation. What are the pros? A 
accommodates a variety of statistical models and assumptions, reduces the distribution of profit and loss changes, unrealistic assumptions about normality are not required, flexible enough to run bar for any type of portfolio, uh, and is flexible enough to handle options and option-like securities, provides greatest level of control over price volatility, and capture non-linear risks. What are the cons? Mathematically intensive and require tens of thousands of simulations. That said, uh, you got a good programmer, right? Somebody you know what they're doing. Requires distribution and correlation assumptions. Okay. So that idea of a normal distribution, you do have to make an assumption. What kind of distribution is it? Normal skewed negative, normal skewed positive, is it just fat tails? You have to make that assumption up front. Uh, less transparent and does not capture fat tail. Oh, it doesn't capture fat tail. So so much for that comment. You know, but is it is it normal distribution? Is it skewed one way or the other? Okay, you can make those assumptions. So let's compare the approaches. Um, has anybody come, especially you know, those those of you in Central Bank, have you come across any reviews where the entities are using any of these three? Approaches for value at risk estimates. <laughs> That's maybe. Yeah, I know, I know one day they do use it, but I'm trying to remember whether, which one, whether it's the historic or whether it's the Gallup. Well, you know what, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like once you get exposed to a term or a, a method or something, I guarantee you now you're going to read it. You're going to read something in the next six months, and something you've learned in this class is going to pop up. Mm -hmm. it's like you see somebody for the first time, and you can't stop seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you wish you hadn't seen them. In the All right, so. What a, let's compare the approaches. Variance covariance requires strong assumptions about the return distributions of standardized assets, but it's easy to compute once these assumptions have been made. The historical simulation requires no assumptions about return distributions, but implicitly assumes that the data used in the simulation is representative of risk going forward. And the Monte Carlo simulation approach allows for more flexibility by choosing distributions and bringing in subjective judgments and external data, but it is the most demanding from a computational standpoint. I guess with the computing power nowadays and programs you can buy, that's becoming less and less of an issue, right? So confidence intervals. So if you want a 90% confidence interval, you want 90% of the area under the normal distribution to be captured, you need to go out 1.65 standard deviations. You want to capture 95% of the area under that normal distribution curve, you need to go at 1.96 standard deviations. And if you want 99%, you need to go at 2.33 standard deviations. Okay, so it's one of these things when somebody, when you're reviewing somebody and they say, oh, we're at 90, our confidence interval is 90%. Oh, how many standard deviations? Oh, we're using one. No, you're, you're a liar. No, I didn't. You sure it's not 1.65? You know you're right. Then they go, wow, these guys are the talk about we can't we can't guess them anymore. Uh, variance covariance. You got the security exposure. What the heck is this? <laughs> Something didn't print on this one. Finally, put in a graph for you guys, and it doesn't have the correct labeling. I have to come back to that. I'll review that and, and give you a, a new copy of that graph. Next, sensitivity analysis inputs or sensitivity approach. Uh, so different types of ex exposure, right? So interest rate exposure. What do we look at? Well, the unit of measure is the dollar value per basis point change in rate. Okay, and what is a basis point? A hundredth of a percent. 
Okay, one percent is a hundred basis points. All right, that's important to know. One percent equals one hundred basis points. Or as investment guys like to say, pips. What do that means? It must be an acronym or something. From some French term. Um, so when it comes to interest rate exposure, what we're looking at is for every basis point change in rate, what's the dollar value impact? Hmm? Bips? Yeah, B I, not P. Not even I. B. Like they just Oh, Bips. Oh, yeah. so I, I heard it was pips. <laughs> I think in the U.S. it's more so pips. Oh. It's like the pips. 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 I don't know. I'm sure I heard pips oh. from the sky. In the U.S. they also use pips. They don't really use pips. 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 pips when they talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pips, that's not like when you say it's get hit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Foreign exchange, equity, commodity, we look at the dollar value of the position. Options, we look at the dollar, dollar value adjusted for the option delta plus gamma expert. <laughs> We didn't talk about gamma and delta. I have to go get my textbook, I'll be honest. If you, you know, if you don't use that on a daily basis, all these things. Basically, when you're valuing an option, like the Black-Scholes model, there's different inputs that go in. For example, delta, gamma, these, these variables that go in the Black-Scholes formula, okay? So, if you have the Black, and actually, if you have the Black-Scholes model, and you see that the inputs are, some of the inputs are delta and gamma, you want to have an idea of, you know, when you start making adjustments to delta and gamma, what is the impact on the dollar value of the option? Okay. That's a good one. Now this, um, the Black Scholes model, there's a guy named, last name Black, another guy, last name Scholl, and together they came together, or maybe Scholl added to Black's model. But it is a it is a way of pricing options. So it's a formula for pricing options. Um, I don't remember it offhand. <coughs> yeah. And I'm quite often Bloomberg is using the Black Shield model. Yeah. So you can go into Bloomberg or Reuters, you can go into these or maybe even Excel, who knows? And you know, put in the inputs. It spits out a price, but quite often the formula behind that is the Black Shoals option pricing model. Um, I don't think we, no, we, don't, we don't talk about that here, but if you want, um, I can print it out. <laughs> Go on, just actually Google it. Yeah, I keep forgetting all the business high-tech world on it now. <laughs> you mean I don't have to grab my textbook with a photocopy? Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, do a little sensitivity uh, aggravation. Ag aggregation, sorry. <laughs> Alright, so we got a, a portfolio here, or we're looking at um, several securities. These are all bonds, right? $1 million five-year, $1 million ten-year, $1 million a 15-year U.S. T-bonds, okay? The sensitivity, $200 per basis point, $450 per basis point, $800 per basis point, okay? And why do why the, the, the dollar values go up? The maturity is going up, right? Further out, further out into the future, there's greater sensitivity to changes in interest rates, right? So that's one thing to note too is that further on that yield curve, uh, when interest rates are changing, you're going to have greater fluctuation further out into the future you go. Okay. The total for your bond portfolio is just those summed up, one thousand four hundred fifty dollars per basis point. Okay. Now, fortunately, the sensitivities can be aggregated to arrive at a U.S. dollar bond portfolio sensitivity change in interest rates because it is the exact same issuer. Okay. All right. The credit risk is exactly the same. It's the U.S. government. Okay. So you can 
So what this is saying is, let's suppose you, you've got a client and they've got 100 US bond positions. All right? You could use this approach and come up with one aggregate of the sensitivity analysis. So their US dollar bond portfolio, for every basis point, we expect it to go up and down $1,450. Okay. Two thousand shares of GE at twenty-five dollars per share. What's the exposure? Two thousand times twenty-five is fifty thousand dollars. One-day volatility is one and a half percent. All right. So we've seen, based on historical data, each day we can expect one and a half percent change in, in the price. That's the level of volatility. So the risk is that during any given day we can expect seven hundred fifty dollars on the downside also on the upside, but we're not really worried about the upside, we're worried about the downside, right? Um, that, that's two asset portfolio. We've got 10,000 shares of GE at $25 a share. We've got uh, exposure of $250,000, the one day volatility is 1.5%. Therefore, the risk is $250,000 times 1.5% is $3,750. We've also got a $20 million U.S. bond, 15-year, um, $800 per basis point, the exposure. It's not, no, this is just assumed, okay. I was trying to figure out where it came from. So we're assuming that there's $800 per basis point per million dollars of the bond. There's $20 million of the bond. That's the 20, right? So for every million dollars from previously, remember the previous example? Let's see, two slides back. For a 15-year US dollar bond, we assumed $800 per basis point. This is $20 million, so it's $800 dollars per basis point times 20, so we've got $16,000 per basis point of exposure. Daily volatility, two pips, or two basis points. Therefore, our exposure is two times 16 or 32,000 in that particular bond, in that particular security. Now, when we look at the two asset portfolio risk or value at risk, it's 33,317.60, it's not 3,750 plus 32,000 or 35,750, it's less than that. Anybody know why? <laughs> Remember we talked about the, uh, the Marco, uh, portfolio theory last week, the Markowitz efficient uh, portfolio theory. Um, basically, there's some diversification benefit, right? To some extent, when this one goes down, this one goes up. When this one goes up, that one goes down. So they offset some of each other's risk slightly, okay? So if we simply add the risk for each asset, the total is $35,750 of, of risk. The correct total is $33,317.60 or $2,182.40 less. This is due to the diversification benefit given that the correlation between the assets is only 0 .3. They're not perfectly correlated. If the correlation was one, there would be no diversification benefit because if the correlation is exact, one goes up, the other one goes up the same amount. They move in the exact same uh, direction the exact same extent. But you can rest assured that, let's suppose interest rates go up, price of bonds go down. But guess what happens to stocks usually when interest rates go up? What, what, what happens? Um, let's talk about interest rates going down, bond prices go up. Uh, quite often, the bond market and the and the equities market they they move in opposite directions. Okay. Um, so when, when 
bond markets are doing really, you know, people are less, more risk averse and they want a secure investment of buying bonds. But people are more aggressive and more, what should I say, uh, less risk averse, they're willing to get into equities. So usually there's kind of a uh, inverse relationship between the two. Not always. But because they're not perfectly correlated, you get some diversification benefit and therefore the total risk less than it would be if you just added the two together. This is a three asset portfolio, all right? So we got the first two securities, plus now we're adding in some gold. We got 1,000 ounces of gold at $1,400 an ounce. That's pretty cool, man. When I created this table, it was 1,400. Then it went to 1,700. Now it's back and forth. See, I didn't have to tell you that. I could have, I could have buffed you all and said, I just created this last night, or last week. <laughs> but it still holds, right? It, it stands the test of time. So in the case of gold, the one-day volatility is measured as a percent, right? So how much exposure do we have to gold? We've got 1,000 ounces. $1,400 an ounce, so we've got $1.4 million worth of exposure. 3% uh, is the one-day volatility, so we've got the potential $42,000 of a loss in a day, okay? If we were to add these three together, we get $74,000, $77,750, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but for th this should be three. To the three acid, uh, I gotta change it. I gotta go. I just said I don't have to change it. I gotta, I gotta go change it. So the three acid portfolio is fifty-six thousand six hundred twenty dollars. Okay. Once again, you've got the benefit of diversification. Uh, this is due to the diversification benefit, given that the correlation between the assets is only 0 0.2, 0 0.3. That should be 0 0.2, and that should be 0 0.1. Okay. Quite often, gold is deemed to be a, a, a hedge when there's uncertainty, when there's deemed to be risk, inflation. Of course, you know, that kind of environment is not good for stocks. All right, so quite often, if this is going down, this is going up. What we've seen recently, right, we've seen share prices going up, bond, bond, a gold buy is coming down. Okay. Uh, I don't see where you get this. Where you get the what? How do you get um, okay, I understand that the total. Okay, so you take the total, total of one and two and multiply it up by mm -hmm. zero point three. No. How? Uh, I have to get this actual variance covariance formula. So I don't think it's actually clear. If you, there's a variance covariance formula, right? You have to plug in one of the, some of the input you'd have to put in would be what is the correlation between these assets, okay? In this case, I mean, I've just, I've just made assumptions here of what the correlation is, okay? Um, did you go into Excel? And, you know, there's a variance covariance uh, formula. Once again, you, you, you would see where you could say what are the inputs, you're, what are your assumptions, what are the inputs? Three of those inputs would be the correlation between between these assets. So you've got one and two, one and three, and two and three. Okay. So now you can imagine if you start to deal with a portfolio that's got a thousand positions, you've now got I don't know how many. It's more than three. You've got a hell of a lot of correlation coefficients that need to go into the formula, right? Um, I think really the, the I'm just trying to see if there's a way to actually use what's here and come up with that number. I don't think there is. I mean, the kind of the kind of question you you know would be if I gave you this. I gave you that. All right. 
you had to come up with what would the what would the, um, the total risk be if these assets were all perfectly correlated, then you just sum these up. But because the correlations are less than one, the question could be, well, is the total risk of this three asset portfolio more than or less than? 77,750. So you have to understand the benefit of diversification, the fact that you have less risk for diversification. So be more about understanding the concept versus doing the actual calculation. But I think I've done that, you know, I'm trying to, I think I've actually, I've got some Excel spreadsheets where I've done um, the actual numbers, number crunching. So. What can you find on Excel? Okay, you just bring it next to We could listen the previous class. What's that? The coronation. The partners in is it? Is it a lit? Yeah, we did it for this class. Yeah, we did it in um Charlene. So we I don't know. Yeah, you could use the formula. What's that? She gave us the formula. Well, so far, yeah, it's been maybe just a lot of theory. Oh, that's a list. That's a lot. Huh? Oh, don't get the... For the 56? I have the formula if you want it. What is it? It's right here. Okay. Could I, could I just take a page? Yeah. Then I guess, yeah, I guess it's more complicated. Okay. This is a lot easier to do to be with the theory behind it, right? Not necessarily the calculation. I think you, it looks like you're going to have a, a lot of calculations in that previous module, right? Yeah. 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 So I mean, investment. Um, kind of combine both. But let me show you the the actual like a two. This is the two asset portfolio. Um, uh, standard standard deviation. Kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah. There's a standard, you know, we're talking about the standard deviation measure of risk, right? Volatility. Mm -hmm. So the standard deviation of the portfolio, in this case, is two assets, is the weighting of asset one squared times. Variance of asset one, which is the standard deviation squared, plus the weighting of what well, is said I of J times that plus two weighting I weighting J covariance I of J. Then covariance, see this, you know, and then this covariance up here, of i and j equals c r i and j i j. The correlation between the two, so that correlation number we're talking about, mm -hmm. times the standard deviation, times standard deviation. So. Covariance of the two assets. If this correlation coefficient was one, you'd have the stand, it'd just be the standard deviation of one times the standard deviation of the other, right? I times J. But because this is less than one, this goes come declines in, in value, right? So the covariance is a smaller figure if the correlation is less than one. Um, let me look, let me look at what I've got. Is my backup for these tables. All right. Looks like Sean is giving you guys a lot of math to 
Honda. Next, we have adjusting the value of risk estimation period. Okay. Up to this point, we just talked. We've been talking about one day. Okay. So adjusting value of risk from one estimation period to another <coughs> is simpler than one may expect. If the period is lengthened, you multiply the value of risk by the square root of the increase in trading days. Right. If the period is shortened, you divide the value of risk by the square root of the increase in the trading days. Assuming a one-day value of risk of $10,000 so for one week, that's five trading days, right? Now, we've, we've got a one-day value of risk of $10,000. If we want to know what the value of risk is for a week, we've got five trading days. We take the square root of five, multiply 10,000 by that, and get 22,360 points. Eight. So if everybody wanted to have a calculation, all right. So I'd leave, leave that out, leave that blank. Give you that, give you that. I can even leave that blank and make you figure out how many trading days. Oh, look, that's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Trading days, but you'd have to know you have to take the square root of this number and multiply one day to get the period. So. One month is 21 trading days. One could argue it's 20. Square root of 21 times 10,000 is 45,825. Three months, 62 and a half trading days, so on. One year, 250 trading days. Okay? You guys get that? Have you? gave you one year and I said what is the one day value of risk? You would take this divided by that. You should get back to uh, so I do a two five zero square root inverse times one five eight one one three point nine I guess it's ten thousand. It's rather embarrassing when you're doing this wrong. <laughs> so there you know, there's there's some you know things you need to remember, some calculations that can be asked. Now that's kind of, and actually when you think about it, before you realize it's that simple, you say, how the hell do I go from one day to 250 days? You know, and uh, it's dealing with the square root. So it's not actually just a multiply. You don't just multiply by 250. You multiply by the square root. Now the last page, I think it's the last slide tonight. <clears throat> Looking at confidence intervals, uh, they're based on what is called in statistics the z-value. Uh, the table below details the number of standard deviations required for a given confidence interval. All right, so if you want to have an 85% confidence interval, then you can use one standard deviation. Again, a normal distribution, right? You want to capture 85% of the area. You go one one uh, standard deviation both ways. 90%, uh, 1.65 standard deviations both ways. 95, 95, 92, 97.5, and 99, right? So. <clears throat> You want to be really, really confident that you've got all the potential outcomes covered, assuming a normal distribution. But you know it's never really the case, so you don't actually have 99% of it. You need to go 2.33 standard deviations to both sides of the mean. Okay. And that is it for tonight.
Lachow's formula, covariance, variance covariance formula. I just gotta find the file. I'm gonna do the I'm gonna go the old fashioned route. I'm gonna find the file that I created. I'm not gonna Google it. I, I, I love people. Hey, what's your source? Wikipedia man. <laughs> you mean that source that I can go in and, and, and change? Yeah. Exactly. Once again, no class next week. What? There's no class next week? No. Everybody has the material from last week? And the handouts? Still good, still good. Is it working? Yes, still good. Still good. Thanks, Mr. Virgil. No problem. That was not a pretty. Don't hold your shoulders. Where are you? I know you're going. I know you're going. I know you're going. I know you're going. Yeah, I'm always hiding here. I like to straighten up. Yeah, don't buy. Yeah, don't buy. Yeah, don't buy. I don't come from Thursday night. I think the finale is Thursday, right? Yeah. 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 You guys, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm we have pizza. We have pizza. We have pizza. Yeah, I think it's nice to
Sharing another side of him, or mm -hmm. I understood he acted in a serious movie the other day, right? Yeah, I mean, Alex. Do you like Alex Cross? I don't know that either. That was good. Alex Cross? I enjoyed that. Yeah, well, I mean, I read the books. <laughs> 
So oh. I kind of I kind of compare it to that. Mm-hmm. Okay. A little disappointed in some ways, but you know, you got a movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You read the book. Well, yeah. I read the books. I read the book. All the time. You always get more. Yeah. And the thing about this is the book is. I mean, the movie is definitely different from the book. Wow. It is so different. And then it's like this main character is missing from the movie. So I I all <laughs> know it all. The main because it's, no, his best friend. Who is like, who is this black, tall, black guy? I do expect it. And so I kind of, in my mind, would just kind of carry it as the best friend more than Alex Cross. Oh, kind of like, yeah, because the best friend is just like that. Which, and it was like, yeah. which, which true means, like, fuck <laughs> you. Yeah, probably, but he didn't have the same name. Yeah, you know me all. Tyler Perry now, the higher, highest paid yeah. actor. Black actor. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 I'm going to do something. 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 But I saw the good like her breasts or something like that, right? Maybe you know, on this talk show. And he was like, say he like a big old titty. What is wrong with Terrence Howard? Straight. He was the same Oprah, aren't you? She's like, no. She's like, well, they are big. Show, <laughs> Tell me something, is the female sentiment towards Barack still the same? Since he okay to be married, or has it wavered? You may owe me. survive if he didn't do it.